What's up, everybody? What's up, everybody? Good morning. Welcome to Worship Team Training, Worship Team Training University. We got Elias Dummer right here with City Harmonic. Great to be with you today on this awesome Friday. What's up, everybody? Go ahead. And if you're watching on Periscope and also on Facebook Live, hey, thanks so much for coming. Uh, Rita Vism, good to see you. How are you? And also on iHeartRadio. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you guys are good. If you're watching by uh, Periscope and Facebook Live, um, I'm going to shoot out a link to you that you can go to the page to get the download that we're talking about. This very song, honestly, that's off of the brand new album release, Benediction, from the City Harmonic. You want to be sure to grab that, and as you do, we put a free, uh, some other free little goodies in there that you can see, and I'll talk about those in a minute. If you're watching this right now, it's because you were invited by a friend or you saw the promotion either by Elias or by Worship Team Training, and we thank you guys for coming in because this is what's happening today. We are talking all about what's the Lord, what the Lord is doing through Elias. Also, we want to share with you a little bit about us at Worship Team Training and uh, what we do here. So let's go ahead and get that started. My name is Brandon Dempsey, and I'm a CEO. First of all, I'm a follower of Jesus first, and I lead a ministry called Worship Team Training in which we train worship teams just like you and worship leaders. Everything from our workshops to our one-to-one -one mentoring and you can find all that good stuff at worshipteentraining.com and you can look at, again, um, find our mentoring and our workshop links. And if you also want to check out our university, this is what we're talking about today. You get to see guys just like Elias here uh, coming in and doing what we do each and every week. We have free live videos that come with the membership. Also, there's articles, there's like over 700 pieces of content and plus you get webinars each month, downloads, ebooks, and live fresh training like this each week. So if it's Paul Balash, Brothers McClurg, Elias, Dummer, we have others. Crystal Lewis is coming up next week for our webinar for vocal stuff. So you wanna learn how to harmonize, you want to focus more on concentrating in that vocal effort, hey, we got you covered right here. But as we get going with today's show, Man, I'm so excited to have our good friend Elias Dummer with City Harmonic. Uh, we have a lot of great people coming on Facebook Live. Thanks so much, you guys. You guys are great. I love you guys. A lot of them are our uh, students. But you know what? We're not here to talk about what's happening here except for Elias Dummer. So uh, Elias Dummer, as you know, is the lead front-running singer of the City Harmonic. They ended their album. Uh, they ended their tour, actually, and started the... Uh, the album release right here, Benediction. He's here to talk about it, so everybody please welcome Elias Dummer. How are you, Elias? Hey, I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. Glad hey, to be man. here. Thanks so much for your time and being with us today. It's a blessing. Oh, yeah. We love it. Awesome, man. So uh, we were talking a lot about the album, Benediction, uh -huh. uh, the song Honestly. Uh, before we get to that, because we want to know the backstory about those things, can you also kind of set us up and let us know, like, you know, how did God call you into doing what you're doing with writing songs and sharing God's word through music? Yeah, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I started in my little church when I was about 12 or 13 years old, hmm. like a lot of churches at the time. You know, there was one guy and a couple of players, and they really needed some more guitar players, so they handed me a guitar and said, here, you, you learn to figure this out. <laughs> and then within a year or two, I was leading at the church, and, and then started traveling and doing different events, and and then eventually um, was a worship pastor at a church and working with some other youth pastors and student pastors in the area to really help create this worship and mission event uh, called Cross Culture, which was all about bringing folks from different denominations together to really help everyone see that I think worship is holistic. You know, there's this sense of singing and music, but then there's also that I think drive and need to be missional in our neighborhoods. And so we'd bring students together and uh, we'd have them sing a little song, kumbaya kind of thing, and then we'd go out and do missions all day in our city and then come back together at night. Uh, and despite these denominational differences, we'd come back together at night and have this big kind of sweaty worship time. <laughs> and uh, that, that band of folks from different denominations eventually became the City Harmonic. And here we are today. Interesting, wow, that's so fantastic. So tell us um, about the journey of the City Harmonic and what led you to where you guys are today. Yeah, well, 
like I said, we came out of that kind of interdenominational event. That was part of something that had been happening in Hamilton for a couple of years at that point. It was about 15 years ago. Um, a couple of pastors started to get together. Hamilton, where I'm from originally, uh, is just outside of, it's about 40 minutes outside of Toronto. Um, once upon a time, was kind of like Canada's Detroit. It was struggling, <laughs> Had industry had collapsed, and so poverty rate, urban poverty was really high. Mm. Um, and so that's kind of what Hamilton was known for. It was like the armpit of mm. Canada in some mm. ways. Mm. Um, and so churches started working together across denominational lines, missionally, mm. to try to improve neighborhoods. Mm. And uh, that was kind of the environment that my band and I all grew up in, was these churches really partnering, meaningfully partnering and working together, uh, dozens and dozens of churches. Um, so that's since, in the 15 years since, Hamilton has gone from being Canada's Detroit to sort of being like Canada's Brooklyn in a way, where... Wow. It's real. There's a lot of creative impetus and um, just a real kind of sense of like urban renewal. Um, and at the heart of that has been churches investing in neighborhoods. So hmm. that partnership of churches actually commissioned the City Harmonic. So we were sent out in 2000, early 2011, um, having just signed a record contract and written songs and all this stuff uh, to go and travel, leading worship, bringing people together, bringing the church together as best hmm. we could. Hmm. both in worship and then also in mission. And so at different times wow. in our uh, career, if you will, we've yeah. focused on different elements of that. But that's really been what we've been called to do and, and thankfully what we were able to do the entire time we were together as a band. Hmm. I love it. Well, your transparency shows through. I, I've watched the live album on video and that was the main thing that really just impressed my heart was just the bringing it real, uh, making yeah. it clear and um, the gospel is present, and that's really what our role is. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just ask you this, if we can just kind of go through some questions. And Sure, uh, yeah, great. You know, as a, as a band, um, you being a worship leader within your church, what do you feel is your most important role? Oh, man. Um, you know, I, this is going to sound interesting, because I know sometimes with leading worship, we'll talk about... Uh, performance versus worship and stuff like that. And to be perfectly honest, I have I have some frustrations with the way that those things get couched. Let's talk um, about it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think in reality, um, the role of the worship leader is to bring people together and break the fifth wall. Hmm. Um, beca because we have to be essentially in the sweaty masses in reality. And the more aloof we are, the more supposedly spiritual we are. And by that, I don't mean spiritual. I mean, like, the more intentionally disconnected from the group that we position ourselves, I think the less effective we're going to be at taking the guy who really needs us. Hmm. Um, and, and the guy at the back of the room with his arms crossed or the mom who fought with her kids to get them out the door to church on time, they actually need us to perform effectively. And by that, I don't mean be fake. I mean... Yeah actually embody the song we're trying to sing hmm. and bear in mind the reality of the audience that we're facing, hmm. um, whether that's a church or a concert. And those contexts are really different. Yeah. And people's expectations are really different. I mean, I lead very often on the Sundays at our church and I'm training worship leaders there. And that's totally different from a city harmonic event. So, um, but nevertheless, that bridge building yeah. is the same value. And it's just context dependent. What are they coming? What are they wanting? What are they hoping to see? What were they just doing? What happened in the lobby? Like, these are very real things I think worship leaders need to think more about. And the irony is, I think, mm -hmm. excelling at that actually kind of means performing more. It just means performing well and authentically, yeah. not less. Yeah, I love that, performing well. Um, I think that's something that a lot of worship leaders and teams try to do. Um, but do you think maybe that some try a little too hard? Uh, well, I th again, I think it depends on what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. if, if the goal, like, you know, you talk about Aretha Franklin singing a song, yeah. right? If she's singing a tragic song, there's a little bit of acting involved, like method acting that says, what does it look like? For me? When was I in this place? Yeah. If we're singing, because there's nothing more selfish than like raw authenticity that doesn't take into consideration the people around you. True. That's not authentic. That's just being a jerk. True. Right? <laughs> and so I think, I think, yeah. I think there's really something to like loving the people in front of you, loving your neighbor, and that in and of itself is worshipful. I think that's what we see in Matthew 23, right? We see, love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like it, and that phrase is key, I think, love your neighbor as yourself. So God very often looks on our worship and filters it and weighs it mm -hmm. by our ability to love the people around us. Mm -hmm. 
So um, that very clear. It's it's most important to you to embody the song, and, and I love how you put that. Uh, starting out when we were talking about the different people in your worship in your church, you mentioned the fifth wall. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit more about what that is to you? Yeah, I mean, in, in in theater, right? There's the stage, and then there's every room has four walls, and, and yeah. there's in theory a fifth one between the stage and the audience. Mm. In filmmaking, they say never to break the fifth wall. They say don't look at the camera, for right. example, right? Because breaking that fifth wall to gets away, gets rid of the fantasy, mm. right? I think the worship leader's job, and ironically, the best rock stars in the world do this well too, people like Bono, our job in, in live anything, but especially in worship, is to break the fifth wall intentionally. Mm. To say, there is no mystique here. There's no dividing mm. line between state. I think the platform is practical. Mm. I think there's a lot of attempts sometimes for... Um, worship leaders, and I think with the best of intentions to say, we're going to sing behind you, we're going to sing over here, we're going to make a circle, but it makes it hard for people who aren't musical to understand what's happening and really feel a part of it, right? So mm. they want to feel connected and it can work, but consistently it can also lead to people feeling more disconnected and feeling like they don't understand what's happening. So I think the responsibility is on the people on the platform to break that fifth wall because it is sort of a necessary evil. Um, and to say, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm here with you, it, both emotionally, I'm coming from where you're coming from, and we're going to go here together. And maybe it's a bit of a pastoral thing, mm -hmm. but, but that sense of breaking that and being connected to the room. No, I love that. I think that's right on the money, and that's where a lot of worship leaders and pastors need to be uh, hands mm -hmm. down. So uh, we're, I want to come back to some of this stuff because this is really good. Um, let's, let's go on and talk also about the album, Benediction yeah, Live. Sure. Why is Benediction Live going to be your final album? Well, we've been playing together for years, mm. and we love what we do and, and are really good friends. And that's, I think for us, uh, Eric, our bass player, had cancer a bunch of years ago, back in 2012. Mm. And uh, about a year and a half ago, decided he was going to step away to focus on planting a church in Hamilton, which is amazing. That's what he had been working towards before the band took off. Mm. Um, and the rest of us continued, and we, we were having a great time. But there was sort of this sense of, like, do what, what are we going to say next together? You know, we were called to a specific thing, mm -hmm. and we did that. We made a movie about it. We told pastors about it. We spent all of late 2015 literally sitting at round tables with pastors all across the country just trying to get them to work together yeah. based on what that kind of white elf poverty was the thing. Everybody, if the church works on poverty, then the community is going to see that the church is for us, not against us. Right. And so I think in a post-Christian culture, unity is essential, hmm. where the church will lose its witness. Hmm. And so I, we otherwise we just look like a scramble, you know, a scramble <laughs> eggs with no flavor. Um, and so, so for me, like with the City Harmonic, we really were intentional. Every record we made was intentional. We kind of set out to do specific things. Yeah. And we asked ourselves, what haven't we done and what have we left to do? And for us, the big thing was we never made a live worship record, and we should have on day one. Um, this was always something, this has always been our DNA, and it's been the heart of the songs. I mean, not every song we ever recorded is intended to be congregational. Lots of them are yeah. kind of not entertainment per se, although they, I hope they are, but they're meaningful yeah. to listen to sure. and sure. more of a discipleship thing. Right. And so we really thought it'd be great to collect the songs that we know we've sung at our churches and that. We love to sing with people and, and maybe a new song in there as well and, and put that together as a final last hurrah. Um, and so we recorded our last tour in Canada, the entire tour, um, but in the end it was our final show in our hometown. Just had so much wow. magic yeah, to it yeah. that we decided to record the entire, to release the entire show. Man, that's so nice. Uh, and speaking of, um, you guys out there watching right now, if you're going to the site, go to wttu.co slash city, and that link is up. If you go to wttu.co slash city, you can find the downloaded, uh, well, get the downloaded song, honestly, and also there's a way that you can get the album that I'll talk about in a second. Can you tell us the backstory of the song, honestly? Yeah, um, I wrote honestly years ago with, uh, or at least part of it, years ago with Carl Carty and Anna Dara Arnold when I was really young cool. and it was my first trip to Nashville and we had three hours to sit down, we just met and we said let's write a song, had a conversation, wrote a song in about 
70 minutes and then I got on a plane and went home. Yeah. And, and that's, that became the song that never went away for me no matter where I went. I would lead at events and people would still be singing that song. I still, you know, we'll get CCLI things and people will still be singing that song in different places mm. from Carl or myself playing it around. And, mm. and so with City Harmonic, we, as we were wrapping up for this record and talking about it, we were like, you know, it'd be great to really try to do something with Honestly. So I got together with Carl and Anadera again in uh, 2016 and we wrote The Bridge and added that to it and then just really went for it in here. And it's and we started playing it again with City Harmonic last uh, in January of this year. Um, huh. and, and everywhere we went, people were coming up and talking about it. So it just became this incredible moment for us of like, this song really means something. And it's from Psalm 51. So everyone knows the kind of create me a clean heart thing. Well, you keep going, <laughs> yeah. which is sometimes often necessary. And, and David says, uh, a, a, a broken and contrite, or a contrite and broken heart, you, O oh God, do not despise. That's right. There's this sense of calling us to brokenness, which I think is kind of countercultural to what we talk about it, it very often, is we have this sense that like, oh no, you're okay, things are fine, you're gonna be all right. And I think Christ calls us to call him Lord. Christ calls us to find ourselves in him, in the body yeah. of Christ, the church, but also in the living Christ and the spirit. And, and we have this sense that like we, participate in that body and that requires us dying in a sense and, and seeing our own brokenness mm. and calling it what it is in order that we can live life more fully i think um, and so this song is that dangerous prayer it's calling our call, or praying that we could be broken before christ in order that we might recognize that of all the things that we have in this world all that we really need is jesus wow a tough question. I love it. Uh, I think that as a church, we've kind of fallen off that track of afraid to be vulnerable and to be broken. Mm -hmm. What are some ways that you think the church can actually champion that perspective that it is okay to be broken, it is okay to be vulnerable, because that's where Christ wants us? Yeah. Oh, man. Um, I think culture is a big part of that. I mean, I, I live in the South now, I live in Nashville, and it's, church culture is just totally different yeah. here than it was back home. There's a lot more people who were born and raised in the church and, and are kind of quite accustomed to sitting through church because it's the thing you do. Mm. It's not to say that they don't want to be there, it's just their, the physical engagement, for example, is not really there sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so I think, I think that transparency starts at the front. It starts with being honest and taking risks which for pastors and leaders is really hard to do and really scary, but I, I think it's necessary. Um, one thing for me um, has been just making sure that I'm able to make better choices by not being afraid. So for me, it's looked like having, uh, being multiple vocations. So like yeah. I own a marketing agency and I'm part-time at my church, which was inconvenient. We had to hire other people for that to be the case, but I wanted to focus on leading and training worship leaders yeah. and bringing some kind of cultural leadership to that. And for my personality and who I am, and this may well be a weakness of mine, so I'm not advocating this as a strength, but when I was full-time at a church as a full-time worship director, um, I found it too scary. I was, I was stressed out and I made poor decisions um, because I was afraid of the consequences hmm. and for my family and for me. And so I think one of the things that I've found is that when I'm able to mix a few things together, for me, I, I make better decisions. I'm a better leader part-time than I was full-time because I'm not afraid. Yeah. Hmm. And so that, that was something that for me, I think that brokenness, that transparency, that ability to lead courageously, um, I just have, you kind of have to know yourself enough to be able to take those risks and hmm. put yourself in a position where you can take those risks in order to be a better disciple. Yeah. I love what you just said, leading courageously. Uh, that's something that as you guys are watching us, and maybe you're not as familiar with what we do here at Worship Team Training, Worship Team Training University, this is what we help with that idea, that reality, the biblical reality of champion through fear. No matter what kind of leader you may be, an audio, worship leader, musician, pastor, uh, we have something for everybody here. And you can check out what we have by looking at the plans, but it's simply to have guys like um, Elias share his backbone, his heart, his, his spirit. And we do this on a weekly basis because we believe that this kind of training and encouragement is something that's gonna stick with you for years like it already has and how 
Uh, Elias is training his own worship leaders in his church. So um, I just want to high five you on that, Elias, because that's just awesome. I think that uh, we can never go wrong with empowering the next generation. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what do you say to this? Uh, I was speaking with a dear worship leader yesterday. He was telling me, yeah, Brandon, but I'm afraid to step out. Mm -hmm. And you just mentioned, we just, le we just you know, left you with that thought. You, know, you left us with the thought about not being afraid. What do you say to worship leaders or songwriters who may be going through those experiences right now? I mean, I've been there. I, there's certainly moments where I'm afraid. Everybody's afraid. You know, I think that's part of the human condition. It's actually a natural part of the human condition. You know, it helps us survive. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's, for me, it, it looked like making changes. It looked like making practical changes that didn't seem fun at first, but in the end have made every part of it more fun for me. Hmm. Um, you know, and I think, too, it made me able to relate to the people in the congregation a little better as well. Um, but but that's, that's sad. I mean, you know, not everybody has the opportunity to create other jobs right. and, and be part-time. And the church may, not, may want a full-time focus thing. And so it just depends on what is there. I, I would say this. I, it can be tempting to say some kind of, like, I don't mean pithy in a bad way necessarily, but some spiritual thing that sounds really easy. Okay. And the truth is that I think sometimes fear can be really crippling and really troublesome in terms of our ability to lead. Hmm. And so while my, my philosophy on worship leading is that essentially if we're a pastor of some kind, it should be our job to be working ourselves out of a job. Yeah, love it. That we are Amen. trying to disciple and replace ourselves constantly. And if we do that, I think not only do we become... Uh, totally necessary to the ministry, which isn't the point at all. Yeah. Um, in fact, thinking that would be terrible and probably counterintuitive, but that, it's that counterintuitive thing that works. It, in working ourselves out of a job, we become successful in creating people. If we're trying to be a little Christ, then like Paul, we're saying, don't, don't follow me, follow me as I follow Jesus. Right. And if we can do that courageously, then I think, I think we will succeed in ministry in kingdom terms, yeah. but it may mean we lose our jobs sometimes. I got fired from a church. Yeah. So, so it, it that's. I, I think it depends on what the big value is. I, I love the honesty, you know, of it all. I mean, and, and what you're talking about is the same thing. We had Rich Kirkpatrick on yesterday talking about the same exact thing. Next week, Tony Guerrero is going to be on our Thursday show, and that's Tony's major theme: is work yourself out of a job. And mm -hmm. if and if you're not better than where you were a year ago. You haven't done your job. I just love that. I love the way that God has wielded that truth within your heart. Mm, um, thank you. Can you talk a little bit now about the band members as far as, you know, this is your final album, like you say. And by the way, guys, if you want to catch the album, go to wttu.co slash city, that link that I just uh, put out there, and mm. you can find the ways of how you can download. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk more about that in a little bit as well. Also find the download link to the song Honestly that we're talking about. Mm. All right. So back to your band. What's next for them? Yeah. Well, um, we're church nerds, so <laughs> we pretty quick, pretty quickly found ourselves doing church nerd things again. I mean, yeah. Eric, Eric uh, planted that church in Hamilton, and that's been going great. Um, I awesome. moved to Nashville from Hamilton about four years ago, and um, about two years ago, uh, my neighbor is a Methodist pastor here and mm. was looking at planting a church right in our neighborhood. And uh, we connected over a love of N.T. Wright and others. And so we just basically wow. started to talk about <laughs> um, what it could look like. I mean, I kind of come from a charismatic, liturgical, theological space. And yeah. so it's kind of Anglican-ish, you know. And so it was a good fit. And we started thinking, hey, what would it look like for us to do modern worship and liturgy it kind of recontextualize it all to this neighborhood and this, and this group of people. Yeah. So that's what we did. We, we launched that plant uh, back in January of 2016, and that's been really thriving. Um, it's been amazing. Um, and then uh, Aaron is now on staff at an Anglican church up in Canada. Um, he's the music director there. And I know Josh is leading the tech team and helping with small groups and different things like that at his, I think it's a Presbyterian church in Hamilton as well. So we all pretty quickly found ourselves doing local ministry um, in the meantime, I've, I've continued to write songs and um, am already starting. I mean, I have a few events now. I'm playing at Kingdom Bound and Worship on the Waterfront in Michigan and awesome. um, up, up in Nebraska this summer. I mean, playing songs that we wrote together as City, but also playing some new material of my own that I'll probably release eventually, um, maybe late this year, early next year. So hmm. it's, uh, it's been a really exciting. I know Aaron's working on a, a record as well. 
um, which is, I think, more kind of like a rock thing. So it's it's been just a lot of fun. It's weird because bands, when bands break up, there's usually some story. Um, and in our case, the story is we felt like God was calling us to close the book, so we did. Hmm. <laughs> um, so, so it's it's sort of like we're we're friends. We get along. We would love to see each other succeed and thrive, and that kind of is the story. Yeah. Um, and so, I think for us, moving on to the next season is just the hope that each of us can carry that calling that we were given by True City in the first place. Well, hmm. Hmm. I love that. And so, for you, what what's next up for you? Yeah. Well, I mean continuing to do what I'm doing at the church and training worship leaders. We've got, I've got one worship leader, for example, here in Nashville, who's just amazing and has been learning the ropes so fast. And so like she's going out, her and her husband are going out on the road with me when we play up in, uh, in Michigan this, this in a couple of weeks. And so, yeah, it's been a lot, just keep continuing to do that and to work myself out of a job in every area that I can, um, working on a record and just digging and investing and becoming a better communicator and teacher as best as I can. Um, right. I think that's really my heart, and and a translator is really what I'm after. I think for me, really, I, I'm I'm really big, not translating languages specifically, but I'm I'm really really big on. I mean, I'm a reader. I'm a nerd. I read a lot of theology and philosophy and different things. And and the truth is that not everybody who sits in a congregation or or sings a song has the opportunity to do that. You know, mm-hmm. or maybe they think that they can't. And so I think part of the role as a songwriter isn't just to spout things that we find in the Bible, but to translate them and give them meaning for people, to give people prayers that that take them deeper and root them in this incredible thing we are a part of called the body of Christ in mm. the church. And so, mm. um, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. We don't have yeah. to make it up as we go along. Yeah. And so I think I think being able to translate those things, including liturgy in our church, that's some part of what we do, um, is to translate that so that it, it, it hits the ground for people today and isn't just this disconnected practice. Wow. Um, so where do, you, where do you put all this stuff now? I mean, as far as, you know, we, we talked a lot about church, culture, reaching the gospel, your music. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the one thing that you keep coming back to? Hmm. I think... I think there's, if there's one idea that I think rings true for us as individuals in the faith, but also for the church and for our communities at whole, is that's that the gospel comes to bear on the whole, not the part. Hmm. That for me as a person, God is interested in my heart, soul, mind, and strength. That it's not just my soul that he wants to wrap out and pull out of my body and put somewhere else. But God yeah. is interested in that sense of thriving as a whole person. You know, hmm. that sickness and death, that these aren't supposed to be part of the thing, you know. Yeah. Um, and then into our communities or as the church in general, that's kind of what the body of Christ is. We are participating in the body of Christ. It's not just some aloof idea that we are actually a part of the whole thing that the gospel comes to bear on each of us. Hmm. And then that rings true for the community. It's a sense of concentric circles hmm. that insofar as we see that the gospel comes to bear on ourselves and our family in Christ, and then our neighborhoods, if we really lived that way and we really kind of took that to heart, yeah. I think our communities would look different than they do. Yeah, no doubt. Well, I, I want to ask you one last question. Yeah. Um, before we get to that, just want to encourage you guys as you're watching this by Facebook Live, Periscope, through the site, and thanks for being on it, checking out WTTU.co and also listening to the broadcast. Uh, here is now where you can actually win the album. It's very, very easy. All you need to do is just uh, look into our membership at Worship Team Training University. What we have is you get the uh, 24-7 on-demand courses. We have over 700 pieces of content. That's video and article. We add two shows every week, just like this, with Elias Pavalash, who, who knows. And then also we follow it up with articles. We have monthly webinars, downloads, ebooks, and specials just like this. And if you sign up today, You'll get two free mentoring sessions included with the membership. Also, you'll get the free album. The first four people who sign up for a membership will get the full album benediction by the City Harmonic. Plus, uh, there's other, good, other goodies that we put in there as well. All you need to do is just sign up for either a monthly membership or a yearly membership. And if you go to wttu.co slash city, you'll find those links there about the monthly membership or the yearly membership. 
take a pick and uh, try it out. We'd love to have you. And you know what? If you're still not convinced, you can also go down to the third button that we have. It says get free trial. So if you want to try us out for a month and maybe uh, help, help us to see how we can prove to you that this is worth your while, try us out for free. Also, you can still get the download of the song Honestly on that same page. So all you need to do is go to wttu.co slash city, C-I-T-Y. Um, Ilias, I mean, Elias, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, no, you're good. Elias, I want to know this. As so many worship leaders and bands and pastors are watching this right now, mm -hmm. and they're hearing you speak about the gospel, and I love it, uh, what, what is, the, what is the, the main thing that's just going through your mind that you want to say to them right now? Hmm. I think, I think to back kind of jump off of what I said a minute ago in terms of it being about the whole self, mm -hmm. you know, um, I think that we have to really pursue, pursue Jesus. Yeah. I mean, to define success and what it means to have a thriving life and in, in the terms of the kingdom, um, it can be really tempting to kind of swallow the medicine of our culture and and I think it's really mixed up in the church very yeah. often, and that includes music. You know, yeah. I think part of why we're wrapping up as a band is trying to think that through. Mm -hmm. do, what do we just hustle because we can? Do we make more records because we can? You know, yeah. or do we say no? We've we've done what we needed to do, and God's calling us into new things, and we're going to do that, even if it might hurt us commercially. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what we did with that We Are event, where we were yeah. all over the states with pastors. So um, I think. Sure, we would have loved that to make money, you know, but it didn't, and that's okay. And it was probably our most successful tour in kingdom hmm. terms. Hmm. You know? yeah. So I think that's really it, is to take a step back and think, what does it mean to succeed as a hand in the body of Christ hmm. rather than as an American or a Canadian or whatever else it looks like? Yeah, love that. Thanks for that. Hey, guys, as we open up right now the Q&A session, uh, we invite you to either type in the comment window your questions to Elias. You can do that through Facebook Live or also Periscope. And even if you're watching or listening to the playback, we can still get those comments out. So go ahead and fire away. Let us know what's on your heart. What would you like to ask Elias about worship, his, their music, their album? Uh, let us know. So while you guys are doing that and getting your questions ready, I uh, just want to high-five Trevor out there on Facebook Live. It says, more ancient liturgical music worship needs to be in modern worship services. I love hmm. that. Love that. Um, can uh, we get a shout-out to uh, Shelly Kahn's on there, some good friends. Uh, so hit us up. Let us know what your comments are. Um, I serve in a liturgical church, and I, I find it just you know so enriching to reach back into the ancient faith and bring it forward. Uh, because there's, our, there's just a lot of incredible uh, riches and truths regarding mm -hmm. worship. Can you give us your perspective on that? Yeah, so I think um, it depends partly on neighborhood and the community that you're a part of. But yeah. um, in our neighborhood, we have a lot of 30-something, 40-something kind of young families with kids. Yeah. And, and they're not necessarily folks who grew up in liturgical churches. Um, we also, being a Methodist church, have all kinds of folks from the Methodist church who yeah. are comfortable with that. Yeah. So I think there's two things at play. One, that without the same education that existed, say, 150 years ago, um, I think we're often guilty of what I call liturgical ADD. <laughs> that we're, we're, we're too concerned with what a thing is called yeah. rather than how a person experiences it. And so um, one, things we're in, one of the things we're intentional to do is not really worry about whether they know what we're doing right now, but rather whether they're engaged in it and whether they understand what they're supposed to be that's participating good, in. That's a good point. And so we contextualize liturgy in a sense. So we're very modern worship style, rock band and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then we'll flow naturally into a litany or a responsive prayer, and we'll flow right back out. And it's it, no different than as if it was a kind of a spontaneous moment of worship. That's often what our things feel like. And we'll, those will include spiritual practices, or we'll sing the Kyrie, or different things, all as part of what we're doing. Um, and then the Eucharist is the same way, the communion every week. Yeah. Um, we'll bring people together every week as a response in worship to what our pastor's yeah. teaching that, that morning or what we're hearing from the Word. Um, and that kind of feels a little bit like an altar call. Mm. It's like it's like it's this 
coming forward to participate in communion. We have people, a prayer team ready to pray for people while they're there and all that kind of stuff while the worship team plays. And yet, if you look at the structure of a liturgical service, we're doing all the things. Yeah. yeah. We're hitting all yeah. the buttons. It just, yeah. we've, we've adapted it or translated it to our culture as best as we can. Yeah. No, I, I, that's just right on. I love that. Um, Neil says this. Uh, he asked a question. And, and by the way, we have a lot of people. Uh, we, we're getting some emails right now saying, love you. Love your music, Elias. Thank you. Awesome. Thank uh, you. Brazil loves you. And uh, Shelly asked, when are you going to be in Nebraska? Uh, in Nebraska. In Nebraska. Uh, August, I think that is August 19th. There I'm you playing go. at an event with uh, Sidewalk and Tenth and a few other folks like that. Um, I think it's in uh, Gothenburg. Okay. Gothenburg, Good. Nebraska. Gothenburg. So. She may know where that is. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Neil's got a question. He's, he said that you mentioned planning a new church. What have you found to be the best outreach tool for planning a new church? Oh, man. We, so we were really blessed in that we had a really great leadership team. Like we planted, yeah. with, we planted out of a large church. We planted with a relatively large planting team of like 60 to 80 people or more. Mm -hmm. um, and really some really high capacity people in there too. So it's just sort of like we did all of the things. Um, but one of the things that we set out to do at the beginning was to be the sort of church where if we were gone, the neighborhood would know. So we've been wow. super intentional about being missional yeah. and about being kind of part of the fabric of schools. Yeah. Um, really, that, that sort of stuff has been key, I think. Um, water bottle handouts on the hottest day. Yeah. Um, Easter and Christmas every year, are, we've given away 100% of our offering. Um, we've just kind of been super intentional about making that kind of what used to be the red door a part of our I mean, we're a portable church, so it's not really an option. So to make ourselves part of the fabric of the community in a really meaningful way, rather than acting like a destination for the community. Exactly, love that. So um, as we wrap up here, uh, simply, what is your role as a servant, and how do you exhibit this within your local church ministry? Oh man, um, as a servant, I think that's kind of something that is for every area of our lives. Yeah. Um, but sometimes I think we can think that that means just giving people what they want. Um, I, I think really it's that serving Christ means following Christ in each context and, and doing that courageously, like we said. Um, so I, I, it's not always easy, and everybody's self-centered in some way, and so you have to take a step back and say, who am I to be to this person right now? Mm -hmm in light of who God's made me to be and, and who he's calling me to be in this neighborhood or this meeting or whatever it is. And so, um, yeah, I think, I think being a servant really looks like being broken before Christ and following him. And it, it sounds pithy to say that the rest falls into place, but to some degree, I think it might be true. Cool. Well, uh, man, it's been a pleasure. Elias, to have you yeah, on. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, and guys, if you want to see more of Elias and other people on Washington Training University, we invite you to check us out, wttu.co. I'm putting out the link right now. And if you go there now, you can win the album by getting a membership with us. A membership is so easy. I mean, simply, you get all this material and content for about a latte a month basically is what it comes down to because we believe in ministry and we don't want the dollar to be a, a barrier between you and God using you to reach that next person in or outside the church. So uh, check that out. You can find everything there and definitely download the free song. Honestly, it's great. Uh, we had it playing at the very beginning of the video. So um, Elias, man, thanks so much for your time and your heart. Thanks for having me again. It's been great, man. Just to, thank you for being real with us today. Oh, yeah. Couldn't be any other way. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I, you know, you just say that because it's always, uh, you know, when you sit down with someone and just talk, I mean, that's really what, it's the relational, uh, yeah. you know, aspect of it all that makes it work. So, Absolutely. so thank you again for coming on. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And guys, thank you for joining us today. And be sure to check out this coming Tuesday with our next local worship leader that we'll have in this seat right here on Tuesday. And then next Thursday, we have... We have a special guest for you, and I can't wait. Tony Guerrero is going to knock it out of the park. 
Also in the same week, we have Crystal Lewis for our vocal webinar. So be sure to check it out, WTTU.co. Look at the event page, and you can find all the happenings right there. We love you. Thank you so much. Elias, thank you. Thanks, man. Thanks all right, again. guys. Love you all so much. See you next time very soon. God's blessings. Bye. Awesome.